We've been going through God's timeline of history, and um, it's actually been a, a longer job than I anticipated. And uh, we're looking at the intertestamental period now. Uh, that will be our next thing. And I thought, well, I can get through this very quickly. And then I started looking at it, and uh, maybe it will take a little bit longer uh, than anticipated. Last time we talked about you know, the divided kingdom and Israel's captivity and those kinds of things. Um, the timeline that I have, um, we are on number 66. And I know we've got um, several different versions of this, but <clears throat> the version I'm using is number 66. And it's entitled, The Restoration of Judah, Return to the Promised Land. Um, you know, after the Babylonian captivity, after the 70 years had uh, finished, there was a return back to Judah. But there actually, and I have a chronology here that I will lay out on the table afterwards that I think does a pretty good job of, in summary form, showing the chronology between the time of the uh, first return by Zerubbabel and uh, finally by Nehemiah. So we're going to look at three returns and just uh, pick up some highlights. And um, I'm going to name you some dates here, uh, bearing in mind that depending on the source that you use, you, they can be off a couple of years. But uh, the intertestamental period, the, the dates are, I think, dated accurately within a few years. Um, but I'm just saying that as a um, to preface what we're going to look at that Depending on um, what you're reading and what source you're using, you might find dates that are slightly different, but that is not the, the essence of what we are looking at. I'd like to begin over in, in Ezra chapter 1, and I think um, it has a message that um, is relevant for us even today. Uh, it's interesting what is happening in the world today, if, if I don't know if interesting is the right descriptor. Perhaps it's scary. Um, we have two uh, German um, technicians working for us this summer, and one of them came up um, to write in to work with me. Um, I forget now. I think it was Thursday morning. And he said, John, you know, if you heard, if you seen, I mean, the world's become crazy. And he was referring to the... Um, atrocities being committed by the ISIS, ISIS specifically the um, widely circulated um, video of uh, taking the head off one of a one one journalist. But let's go to Ezra chapter one in verse one here and notice what Ezra records in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying. Here we see a, a kind of classic example of God working in the hearts and minds, in this case, of a Gentile king, causing him, as it says here, he stirred up the spirit of Cyrus to have him do something to take legal action in order that his will would be fulfilled. And I believe we're seeing those kinds of things occur by the action and inaction of political leaders, and, you know, we're, we're just seeing God's will come to pass. We're seeing consequence coming to pass, particularly in this country, uh, because of the depravity that we have now embraced as a nation. And it is inescapable. But we can be confident because we know the outcome. The Feast of Trumpets and Tabernacles are almost upon us and all that that symbolizes. And I am absolutely, we can 
take confidence in what we just read, that God at the appropriate time will stir up the spirit within individuals to cause them to take actions that will make world events come to pass in the manner that God predicted millennia ago. Notice what this Gentile king wrote. Quote, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Well, now, who would have thunk it? You know, you have the very Gentile nation that came and destroyed Jerusalem. Now you say, you know what? God told me I should build him a house. On our way in, I was listening to a radio program in which the question was asked, well, you know, will there or can there be a temple built in Jerusalem? And how is this going to happen? We've got two mosques on the Temple Mount. And, (laughs) you know, it seems like an impossibility. But when the time is right, God will stir up the spirit in some leader to cause him to do what is described here. And all of a sudden, the unthinkable uh, happens. Uh, A contemporary case of this kind of thing is the late 1980s when the... um, uh, Soviet Union collapsed, and literally overnight there was a sea change. Without any, I mean, the the unimaginable thing was that this could all occur without a war. And it was like overnight the Berlin Wall came tumbling down. Continuing in verse 3, Who is there among you? of all his people, may his God be with him. Now let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel, he is God, which is in Jerusalem, and whoever remains in any place where he sojourns, let the men of his place help him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, beside the freewill offering for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem." Then the heads of the fathers of the houses of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites with all those whose spirits God had moved. You see, God, in order to fulfill the prophecy of Jeremiah, moved the hearts and minds not only of the Gentile king but also of specific individuals who would go back to build the temple. Whose spirits God had moved arose to go up to build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. And all those who were around them encouraged them with articles of silver and gold and with goods and livestock, with precious things besides all that was willingly offered. Now, here's another thing that happened that just seems unthinkable. Verse 7. King Cyrus also brought out the articles of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken from Jerusalem and put in the temple of his God. So, when Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem before he burned the temple down, he uh, went in and got all the, you know, articles of silver and gold and took them to um, Babylon and Persia and put them in his treasury, in the house of his gods. Now you have, you know, roughly 70 years later, or exactly 70 years later, depending on um, when you count from, you have... (laughs) Another king doing the reversal. You know, he is he was inspired by God to bring it back. 
And Cyrus, king of Persia, brought them out by the hand of Mithraeth, the treasurer. Verse 9, this is the number of them. Thirty gold platters, one thousand silver platters, twenty-nine knives, thirty gold basins, four hundred and ten silver basins of a similar kind, and one thousand other articles. <laughs> I mean, these are things that, I mean, you talk about priceless items that had been taken into the captivity and then brought back. It would be interesting to figure out uh, the, the uh, volume or, the, or uh, the, just the, the, the value today of the silver and gold contained in it. All the articles of gold and silver were 5,400. All these Sheshbathar took with the captives who were brought from Babylon to Jerusalem. So it was a, a remarkable turn of events that God showed his sovereignty and his dedication to uh, restoring Judah and returning them to the promised land. And then, of course, in, in chapter 2, you've got great detail of the tribes. And, I mean, you... You read this stuff and you say, "Oh, yeah." I mean, if you have, in, if you can't sleep one evening, you know, you you read this and you try to um, look at all the names. But there's a reason for recording this, and the reason is, given this much detail in such minutia, adds to the credibility of the Bible. It's kind of like a book. That doesn't. That has a lot of end notes, or footnotes, as the case may be, um, giving source material for the ideas that are expressed in it, so that someone else can go and independently verify the veracity of the ideas being written. Let's go over to. Um, and this, by the way, was. Um, around about 537, 538, you know, 70 years from the time that the, um, they had been taken captive. And just as a matter of overview, you know, that's 538, when um, Nehemiah finally goes to uh, Jerusalem, this would have been the third return, uh, to get the temple finally built, was... Uh, 444, nearly, well, 90 years later. See, this was, I mean, the, you know, I think sometimes we think of, okay, the one day the Jews were released from captivity, they come back and the temple is built and, you know, all, all in a compressed period of time. It's actually um, a period of 100 years. So um, it, it does... Um, some of these things take a long time um, as a result of you know, maybe not having the, the leadership that was necessary to um, um, to get it done effectively. When, you know, when Cyrus uh, issued this decree that we uh, just read, um, it's important to note that Isaiah said the Jews would return under Cyrus to rebuild the temple 200 years before. And uh, the scripture to make that notation is in Isaiah chapter 44, 26 through 28, and chapter 45, verses 1. So God was simply backing up the word that he had given through uh, his prophets. So... Here we have the, re the first return through Zerubbabel, who um, returned with 49,897 people from Babylon. 49,897. That's from this chronology. Um, I did not go through and verify that. So for those mathematically inclined among you, um, you go ahead and add it up and see if the numbers work. Um, uh, 
So uh, Zerubbabel was the um, the leader of this particular uh, return, and um, uh, Joshua was the high priest. So let, let's take a look here. Uh, we'll just um, look at a couple of highlights here in, in, in chapter 3. And when the seventh month had come and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered together in, as one man to Jerusalem. And Jeshua, the son of Chosdak, and his brethren and the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shield, Shealtiel, and his brethren arose and built an altar of, the, of God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it, as is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Though fear had come upon them because of the people of those countries, they set the altar on its bases, and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord. Both the morning and evening burnt offerings, they also kept the Feast of Tabernacles as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings in number required by the ordinance for each day. So they got back. They got here. They restored worship in Jerusalem. And in verse 8, Now in the second month of the second year of their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Chosadak, and the rest of their brethren, and the priests and the Levites, and all those who had come out of captivity to Jerusalem, began work and appointed the Levites from 20 years old and above to oversee the work of the house of the Lord. So here we see that two years, they were there two years, and they, they started building the temple. They had erected an altar, but now they're building a temple. And uh, <laughs> I guess um, that would have been around 536. But then we see the problem in chapter 4. Now, when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the descendants of the captivity were building the temple of the Lord in Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and the heads of the father's houses and said to them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as you do, and we have sacrificed to him since the days of Azarhaddon, the king of Assyria, who brought us here. And these are now the, the, um, the people that as it's said here, the king of Assyria brought to the northern tribes, or as um, it was called during the days of Christ, Samaria. And they had uh, brought with them their religion and then adopted and come up with a kind of a syn syncretic uh, form of worship where they mixed uh, the pagan with the true religion. And in verse 3, But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the heads of the fathers' houses of Israel said to them, you may do nothing with us to build a house for our God, but we alone will build to the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded. Then the people of the land tried to discourage the people of Judah. They troubled them in building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So... By three years after they got there, the work on the temple had begun and stopped. And, um, and it, it says here that they frustrated their purpose all the days of Cyrus, the king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So they didn't, um, weren't able to, um, to move forward. Dropping down... And again, I, as I said, we're going to have to kind of step through this and highlight it. Otherwise, we won't get through. Um, let's go to chapter 6. Chapter 6 is datelined um, in, uh, in Darius here um, that's referred to reign from 521 to 486. Um and he issued a decree for the completion of the temple around about 520. So it stopped in 535, and then in 520 he issued another decree. So for 15 years, nothing happened because of political wrangling and um, 
discouragement. Verse 1 of chapter 6. Then King Darius issued a decree, and a search was made in the archives, where the treasures were stored in Babylon, and Achmetha in the palace, that is, in the province of Media, a scroll was found, and in it a record was written in the first year of the King Cyrus, of King Cyrus, King Cyrus issued a decree concerning the house of God in Jerusalem. Let the house be rebuilt. Place the places where they offered sacrifices, etc., 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 etc. So they went back to to the records and um, and said, um, oh, "Wait a minute, um, we." Um, we need to um, go ahead and uh, start rebuilding this. Verse 8. Moreover, I issue a decree as to what you shall do for the elders of these Jews for the building of the house of God. Let the cost be paid at the king's expense from the taxes on the region beyond the river. This is to be given immediately to these men so that they are not hindered. So you have here um, a decree, a follow-up decree, that um, not only are they to restart it, but we're going to take the money from the taxpayers. So you can kind of imagine, you know, what was circulating in the news at that point. Because, you know, for, for 15 years they had managed to intimidate them and to stop building. And now all of a sudden, it backfired to them, backfired on them, and um, the decree was reissued, and it was to be uh, done at taxpayer expense. Verse 9, And whatever they need, young bulls, rams, and lambs for the burnt offerings of the God of heaven, wheat, salt, wine, and oil, according to the requests of the priests who are in Jerusalem, let it be given them day by day without fail, that they may offer sacrifices of sweet aroma to the God of heaven and pray for the life of the king and his sons. Also I issue a decree that whoever alters this edict, let a timber be pulled from his house and erected and let him be hanged on it and let his house be made a refuse heap because of this, good old-fashioned, top-down, Gentile organizational methodology. Just, you know, people were afraid in um, historical Gentile regimes of literally losing their heads. You know, the... The modern term that we use, heads will roll. I mean that that that's that was not a joke. Um, they would and did take people's heads off, and of course, uh, you know we we think of that as being barbaric, and it is. But um, we've seen it in the last number of weeks. On our television screens, heads displayed on poles and in the street. Um, but I mean, that, I mean, again, that's just standard methodology, and um, I mean, it's from the same area of the world when you think about it. Not much has changed, and this was a deterrent. You know, you're going to you're going to support these guys in Jerusalem, and you're going to bring them whatever the the priest want, and if you don't, well, then we'll uh, take your head off. And by the way, we're going to, uh, or rather, we're going to hang you, and we're going to take the beam from your own house um, to, to string you up, and then we'll make your house an ash heap. And may a God who causes his name to dwell there destroy any king or people who put their hand to the altar or to destroy this house of God, which is in Jerusalem, I, Darius, issued a decree, let it be done diligently. So that's in, in um, 
521. Um, and um, there is a um, company of 50,000 people that goes back, and the purpose is to build the temple. <laughs> but there was resistance. There was a considerable amount of resistance, actually. Um, and um, let's take a look here. I mean, we see a, um, a summary here in, in verse 13. Then Tataniah, governor of the region beyond the river, Shethar, Bosnai, and their companions diligently did according to what King Darius had sent. I mean... They were leaving pretty good, and they didn't want their house to be an ash heap. So, I mean, that is command and control motivation. So the elders of the Jews built, and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai and the prophet and Zechariah, the son of Edo. And they built and finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel and according to the command of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia, now the temple was finished on the third day of the month, Adar, which is in the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. So if we presume that, you know, Darius issued this decree, what was it, does it say when he issued it? I'm sure you could figure it out. But it was in a relatively um, short period, period of time. But it wasn't without... Um, it wasn't without resistance. Um, it um, it um, if we go over to Zechariah. Um, let me take a look here. As for six through nineteen through twenty, which we just read, um, was in uh, the first month during the time of Passover. Let's, let's read that. Passover was celebrated. And the descendants of the captivity kept the Passover in the 14th day of the first month. For the priests and the Levites had purified themselves. All of them were ritually clean. And they slaughtered the Passover lambs for all the descendants of the captivity, for their brethren and the priests, and for themselves... Then the children of Israel who had returned from captivity ate together with all who, were se who separated themselves from the filth of the nations of the land in order to seek the Lord God of Israel. And they kept the Feast of Unleavened Bread seven days with joy, for the Lord had made them joyful, and they turned the heart of the king of Assyria toward them to strengthen their hands in the work of the house of of the God of Israel. One th thing that you that you see with each revival, if you will, in the history of Israel is that they keep the holy days. You saw that when you know when you uh, when when they entered the land um, under Joshua. One of the first things they did is when they celebrated the Passover, when when Solomon uh, dedicated the temple, they kept the Passover. Um, when they returned in 538 and erected a um, an altar, they kept the holy days. They kept the Passover, and here we now have when the temple is completed. They kept the Passover and the days of unleavened bread. So we come back to um, a truism. In Exodus chapter 31, verse 13, let's go there for a moment. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 31. Exodus chapter 31, verse 13 says, Speak also to the children of Israel, Surely my Sabbath, plural, you shall keep. For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I, the Lord, 
and the Lord who sanctifies you. Um, it, um, it is a truism that the people of God, when they embrace the scriptures, they come to the conclusion that the Sabbath and the Holy Days are to be kept, and that becomes an identifying sign and has been down through time. I mean, the, the distinction between the lost ten tribes, the northern tribes that lost their identity, and the Jewish people that came back to the land is the Sabbath. The Sabbath, as God had um, spoken back here to Moses, became the sign with which the Jewish people did not lose their identity through all this, these millennia. You know, from, from the time of having entered the promised land, from the time of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they have retained their ethnic, cultural, and religious identity because of the fact that they rested, or at least recognized that I ought to rest one day in seven, namely the Sabbath. I mean, it's, I just, I, I, I find those things to be remarkable. We can say it doesn't matter. We can say it doesn't make any difference. We can say whatever we want. It just does not change the fact that it is so. And we see, you know, in, in the... In the timeline of history, God's timeline, that he intervened and that whenever there was a revival, when, when there was passion and energy put into let's look at the scriptures and let's see what they teach us and let's act on it, you will always find a connection with a connection to, you know, Esther and Nehemiah, we read about the keeping of the Feast of Tabernacles and the Passover is recounted. We can argue that it's just a day, that it doesn't matter as long as we um, recognize a day. But the reality is that Time has shown that whenever a group of God peop God's people do away with, and you know the the seven day principle, you know just if we look at the if we look at the progression even in my lifetime of um, keeping one day in seven, even on the wrong day, namely Sunday, um, but doing it diligently. And in fact, if you if you look at the the most of the history of the United States leading up to and including the early part of the the 20th century, you will find Sunday to be referenced in historical books as being quote unquote synonymous with the Sabbath, or they will say you know we will keep the Sabbath. Um, I remember growing up. I think I've mentioned this before, but bear with me. I remember growing up in a little town of New Bedford, and when Sunday morning arrived, it, you could hear the birds chirp. There was, there was no activity going on. Even doing that, because structure shapes culture, brought a measure of stability and a, a culture that was better somehow, than the mad rat race that we have today, where we have fast food church, and it's kind of like a drive up to McDonald's. You can be there and have your cup of spiritual coffee and be on your way in a very short order. Um, get church out of the way in the morning early, or even the night before, um, so that you can do so that you can seek after your own pleasure. You see, what I'm trying to say, and I hope I'm being effective, is we can, 
we can uh, come up with really rational sounding reasons why the truth is not so. But it changes nothing. You know, truth by its very definition is immutable. You can't change it. If we modify, quote unquote, the truth, it can only mean one of two things. Either our understanding was not accurate before and we've moved closer to the truth, or it was in fact accurate and we're moving away from it. For truth to be truth, it is by definition unchangeable. And if we think, if I think that I can somehow um, outgame it, we will always be mistaken. So in, in, this, in this particular return in the building of the temple, the purpose was to build the temple. The problem was the Samaritan opposition, which um, um, we, we, we saw here. But when, uh, <laughs> when the edict was um, reissued and consequence put on it, you know, they complied. Um, and then in chapter 7, we have the, the um, arrival of Ezra. But I'd like to um, insert something here in the, in the timeline. Again, the, the temple was finished in, in 520, um, or rather in 515. Um, you know the story of Esther? Esther factors into this whole um, return. It was in 486 that um, Xerxes or, ha or Hazarus fought the wars against Greece. And then Esther became his queen. And it was in 478, 474 that um, Esther was delivered. Let's go over to um, Esther chapter 3. In chapter 2, Esther becomes the queen. Um, and um, Mordecai discovers a plot. And then in chapter 3, Haman's conspiracy against the, the Jews started. I mean, he just... Um, Haman somehow... Um, just epitomizes political intrigue. I mean, he 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 was just he was really good, and um, the, the 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 whole story here of Haman plotting and um, erecting a uh, gallow upon which to hang Mordecai, and again you see God's divine hand at work because. The king couldn't sleep that night, you know, and I mean, it all just played out uh, in a way that um, nobody could engineer. Not even the most, um, you know, what do you call them today? The political strategists that um, strategize how to manipulate political things. Um, and, I, and again, I, I think that's what we're seeing today. Um, and, you know, um, men put together plans and uh, whenever those plans uh, do not coincide with the, um, the will of God, it doesn't take very much for him to um, um, go ahead and um, dissolve them. So Mordecai, in chapter 4, verse 14, Mordecai comes to Esther and says, Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise from the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. 
So one of those critical, pivotal scriptures in which an individual is faced with a crucial choice. A crucial choice that made a crucial difference, in this case, in um, uh, in um, the events leading up to the final or the second return to to Judah. So in verse 16, then Esther said, told them to return this answer to Mordecai: Go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days or for three days, night or day, my maids and I will fly fa fast likewise, and so I will go to the king which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. The consequence, when you think about this, here you have the queen. It was against the law even for the queen to go in to see the king unbidden and the consequence of doing so was death I mean you you, you talk about tyrannical rule um, this is why Jesus said you know the Gentiles seek to lord it over you but with you it shall not be so Verse 2 of chapter 5, So it was when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court that she found favor in the sight of Esther, and he held out the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther went near and touched the top of the scepter, and the king said to her, What do you wish, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given to you up to have my kingdom. And then, of course, Esther uh, requested a banquet several times, and... Um, the king was, you know, he wondered what in the world, you know, what's going on here? And it all came down to Haman who was hanged instead of Mordecai and um, um, the Jews were saved. And this all played into um, the second um, return because Mordecai became... Mordecai became um, prime minister, essentially, and the Jews had a pretty substantial uh, influence in the court. The second return came through a decree issued by Artaxerxes for Ezra to return and establish worship. And this is in Ezra um, chapter 7, verse 1. The leader was Asra. It came as a result of the decree of Artaxerxes. Um, there was a company of 2,000 people that went with Asra. And now you think, okay, what was the what was the problem here? Well, the problem was that uh, he went back because of the heathen marriages. Let's go back over to to Asura. Chapter 7 records the um, return of Asura. Um, and it lists here in chapter 8 the families that um, returned with him. And then in chapter 9, it records the problem. When these things were done, the leaders came to me saying, the people of Israel and the priests... And the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the land with respect to the abominations of the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Perizzites, and the Jebusites, and the Ammonites, and the Moabites, all of those ites, and the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons, so that 
the holy seed is intermingled with the peoples of those lands. Indeed, the hand of the leaders and the rulers has been foremost in this trespass. It was the leadership, Asher records, that was taking the lead in these matters. So when I heard this thing, I tore my garment and my robe and plucked out some of the hair of my head and beard and sat down astonished. Then everyone who trembled at the words of the God of Israel assembled to me because of the transgression of those who had been carried away captive, and I sat astonished until the evening sacrifice. At the evening sacrifice, I arose from my fasting, having torn my garment and my robe, and fell on my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord God and said, O oh my God, I am too ashamed and humiliated to lift up my face to you, O oh my God, for our iniquities have risen higher than our heads, and our guilt has grown out of up to the heavens. Since the days of our fathers to this day, we have been very guilty for our iniquities, and for our iniquities, we and our kings and our priests have been delivered into the hands of the kings of the lands to the sword, to captivity, to plunder, and to humiliation, as it is this day. Ezra was the newcomer, and he was astonished at what they had done. But those in Jerusalem including the Levites and everybody else, had so intermarried with the peoples of the land that the holy seed, as it says here, had been intermingled. They have forgotten or ignored or said it doesn't matter what God had revealed through Moses that they were not to take wives from the peoples of the lands, or to give their daughters in marriage. Because, and the reason given, the rationale for doing it is, they shall turn your hearts to serving other gods. It's one of those shall commands. Even Solomon, who was so wise that he wrote book after book of Proverbs, who had wealth and might, could not escape the consequence of this law. In the end, his wives which he had taken for political purposes, turned his heart away from serving his God. Verse 8, And now for a little while grace has been shown from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a peg in his holy place that our God may enlighten our eyes and give us a give us a measure of revival in our bondage for we are for we were slaves yet our god did not forsake us in our bondage but he extended mercy to us in the sight of the kings of persia to revive us to repair the house of our god to rebuild its ruins and to give us a wall in judah and jerusalem and now o oh our god what shall we say after this for we have forsaken your commandments which you have commanded by your servants and the prophets saying the land which you are entering to possess is an unclean land with the uncleanness of the people of the lands with their abominations which have filled it from one end to another with impurity now therefore do not give your daughters as wives for their own sons nor take their daughters to your sons and never seek their peace of prosperity that you may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it as an inheritance to your children forever. 
And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great guilt, since you, our God, have punished us less than our iniquities, iniquities deserve and have given us such deliverance as this, should we again break your commandments and join in marriage with the people of these abominations? Would you not be angry with us until you have consumed us so that there would be no remnant or survivor? O Lord God of Israel, you are righteous, for we are left as a remnant, as it is this day. Here we are before you in our guilt, though no one can stand before you because of this. He recognized and articulated in, a, in I think, a very powerful way the source of their weakness. They had come back out of captivity, had built an altar, completed a temple in spite of themselves, and went right back to doing those things that got them into captivity in the first place. We are in a country today that has elevated as a human right certain relational practices that God calls an abomination. And the consequence will be as sure as the rising of the sun. We are preaching same-sex marriage equality from our national cathedral and the Smithsonian Institute has just, it was announced this week in the news, added an exhibit to honor transgenders. You can say you think you are a woman if you are in fact a man for as long as you want to and you can go through as many surgical procedures and cross-dressing uh, and avail yourself to whatever you want. <laughs> You're never going to change the fact that genetically you are a man or vice versa. Our president does not have time to, barely has time to break up his golf game to um, take charge of huge international issues and atrocities. But when we had the gay games in Cleveland a few weeks ago, which I don't know if you, Cleveland has been the proud host of gay, the LGB community games for years. He did, however, have the time to record a special message video to be played as the introduction welcoming them to Cleveland, Ohio. What an incredible honor it is. And, you know, our priorities are what we do. Now, of course, of course, it's really wonderful to uh, talk about those world affairs and the big bad people out there. But, you know, what about the church? I mean, oh, what about me and you? How have our views changed on those issues and marriage in general over the last 30 years? I guarantee you that we've been influenced. And to the extent that we have, you and I will suffer the consequence. It's just, it is natural law. It is as sure as, you know, if I drop my, you know, if I take my Bible and I push it over the edge here, what's going to happen? Time and space will take over, and depending on the, the, the space from... From here to the floor, a certain period of time will take place and then the consequence of hitting the floor will happen. It did back then. 
But, verse 1 of chapter 10, Now while Ezra was praying and while he was confessing, weeping and bowing down before the house of God, a very large congregation of men, women, and children assembled to him from Israel, for the people wept very bitterly. And Shechaniah, the son of Jehiel, one of the sons of Elam, spoke up and said to Ezra, We have trespassed, trespassed against our God and have taken pagan wives from the peoples of the land. Yet now there is hope in Israel in spite of this. Now therefore let us make a covenant with our God to put away all these wives and those who have been born to them according to the counsel of my master and of those who tremble at the commandment of our God and let it be done according to the law. Oh, come on. I mean, what kind of radical idea is that? Can you just imagine? I mean, there was a great number of people who wept bitterly, who, who recognized this. But culturally, it was, I mean, give me a break. How can you be so radical? Well, you know what? Sometimes the truth is radical, not because it is irrational or radical, but because society and culture... And you and I have stepped so far away from that truth that it seems radical. Arise for this matter is your responsibility. You know, we, we are so concerned in our culture about rights that you barely hear anything about responsibility. We also will be with you. Be of good courage and do it. Then Ezra arose and made the leaders of the priests, the Levites and all Israel, swear an oath that they would do according to his this word. So they swore an oath. Then Ezra rose up from before the house of God and went into the chamber of Jehohanim, the son of Elishab, and when they came there, he ate no bread and drank no water for he mourned because of the guilt of those from the captivity. And then, of course, it describes what happened. Let's look at the, in the few minutes that we have left, let's look at the third return, and this time, Nehemiah is the leader. And he came as a small group. I mean, the, I think I said earlier it was a hundred years between the time they returned and the temple was built. What I, I misspoke. It was the, it was a hundred years until the wall was completed in 432. And his purpose was to build a city wall and to reform. And the problem again was the Samaritans and mixed marriages. Um, let's go over. I, I think it's in Nehemiah. Let's go look at Nehemiah. Yeah, Nehemiah chapter 4 is a classic. But it so happened when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, that he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. So, you know, the standard tactic, if you don't have facts, is to use derision and mockery. And he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they go fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubble, stones that are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him, and he said, Whatever they build, if even a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. I mean, this just sounds like popular media today. You see, the, the victim mentality dates back to the garden, and no, it dates back to 
the father of the lie himself, Satan was a victim. And God was unfair. So you fathered a lie. I mean, these guys are just playing into his hands. And they say, I mean, <laughs> these dumb Jews, if they build a wall and the fox bumps against it, it's all going to fall over. But in reality, they knew. Like Satan knew that God was behind it. But misery loves company, so what does Satan do? What do the agents of Satan do? They, they, they try to take as many people, quote-unquote, with them as possible on the, way, on the way down. Verse 4, Hear our God, for we are despised. Turn their reproach on their own heads and give them as plunder to the land, to the, um, um, to the land of captivity. Do not cover their iniquity and do not let their sin be blotted out from before you, for they have provoked you to anger before the builders. So we built the wall. And the entire wall was joined together up to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. And it took Nehemiah coming back and exercising his influence and motivating the people and encouraging them that they could build the wall. You see? They had, in all these years, there was a temple, there were all these problems, but they hadn't built the wall. Now, it happened when Sambalat, Tobiah, and the Arabs, and the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps were being closed, that they became very angry. I mean, why would you be angry? All you, you just go catch some foxes and send them... Uh, Send in the assault of the foxes. The wall will fall over. You see, they knew that wasn't true. So they got angry. And all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create, create confusion. I mean, do what you said. Send in the foxes. Oh, no. They come in and they want to cause confusion. Nevertheless, we made our prayer to our God, and because of them, we set a watch against them day and night. Then Judah said, The strength of the laborer is failing, and there is so much rubbish that we are not able to build the wall. And our adversaries said, They will neither know nor see anything till we come into their midst and kill them and cause the work to cease. So, you know, you, 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 you had people that on both sides that were afraid. Notice what they did. So it was when the Jews who dwelt near came and that told us ten times for whatever your place, from whatever place you turn, they will be upon us. Therefore I positioned men behind the lower parts of the wall at the openings and I set the people according to their families with their swords, their spears and their bows and I looked and arose and said to the nobles and the leaders, and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters and your wives and your houses. And it happened when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had brought their counsel to nothing, that all of us returned to the wall, everyone to his work. So it was from that time on that half of my servants worked that construction while the other half held spears, the shields, and the bows, and wore armor, and the leaders were behind all the house of Judah. Those who built the wall and those who carried burdens loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked at construction, and with another they held a weapon. You know, that is impossible. But they did it because they had a mind to work. And I just got a signal that I'm done. You see, I, I think it is important for us to see the dynamics that happen during, during such periods of time and how God, despite everything, 
is able to work in the minds and hearts of individuals to make sure that his plan comes to pass. That's, that's one part of the equation. The other part is that the, his people need to have a mind to work. You know, we live in a Laodicean society. Just as these people lived in a culture that was incongruent with all that God is about. Our challenge is to be about and to have the courage to do what we know is right. Because it took three decrees, three revivals, to get done what arguably could have been done in a fraction of the time. Not because God wasn't working, but because his people didn't have the courage and a mind to work. <laughs>